Amen. We want to say greetings to everyone, and God bless you all for joining us. And uh, we thank God for this opportunity to be able to come before you and uh, bring the word of the Lord to you. Uh, it's always a blessing to be able to uh, come before you and share God's word with you all and to, uh, to hear what he has to say for us in this, in this day and age. And as we always stress, uh, God always has something to say. The question is, are we listening to what he has to say to us? And are we taking heed to uh, what he has to say? <clears throat> God is not a silent God. He's a God that knows about what's going on in everybody's life. And uh, he speaks to us uh, how he chooses. And uh, the question is, are we, are we listening to the message that he's speaking? And sometimes I think what gets people thrown off is uh, they expect to hear from God one way, but he comes another. Or they expect to hear uh, one thing, but he says another. And the way God have dealt with me is in layers, which is how he deal with everyone. Uh, we want to hear from God about one particular thing, but God is saying, no, I have to get this thing out of your life first before I can speak to you about that, you see. And so that's the way God operates. And, uh, and, and so we, we thank God, of course, for his wisdom and the understanding of his word. And uh, we pray that this ministry will continue to be a blessing to all of those who are listening in. And uh, as we always say, we pray and ask God uh, and ask you all to, to uh, help us in our, you know, as far as your prayers. Uh, we solicit your prayers always because uh, we are constantly being attacked by the enemy. And uh, it's, it's because the enemy doesn't want the word of God to go forth. And so... Uh, but we, we know the end of it. We know that in the end we'll be victorious, you see. And so we praise God for that victory. Uh, it doesn't stop us from having to go through it, but uh, it, it does mean that we'll be victorious in the end. And that's what we rest in, is victory. And so today we're going to talk about uh, the preacher and the fact that the world needs a God-sent preacher. And notice we see, we, we use the term God sent because there are a lot of preachers. Um, there are a lot of preachers who are not God sent. Their mama sent and their daddy sent because mama or daddy was a preacher. Or uh, their Bible college sent because I went to Bible college, therefore I must be a preacher. Uh, but we're talking about God sent preachers. And, and notice we also use the term need you need a God sent preacher, you see. And, and so this morning we're going to uh, say some things that, that the, the world isn't used to hearing, but we're going to say them and we're going to back it up with the word of God to, to help people get an understanding, you see, to help people get an understanding. All right, so if you have your Bible, let's go to the 10th chapter of the book of Matthew. And we're going to look at a, the commission of these God sent preachers, you see. And again, we'll say it. You need a God sent preacher, not some preacher who can speak well, uh, some preacher who may have a college education, who you esteem uh, above others, or some preacher who live in a nice house, who have a big church or even a small church, or your cousin who happens to be a preacher, or your daddy who happens to be a preacher. You need a God sent preacher, you see. Why? Because God only works through the vessels that he sends. You see, that's all. Uh, he's not going to work through somebody that somebody else has sent. Now, you may say, well, this, that preacher that I listen to on TV or that I, my church, he's very inspirational. I always feel inspired when I go and listen to them preach. Uh, the devil uh, has inspiration, too. He inspired a third of the angels. <laughs> to to rebel with him you see and so the question is what are you being inspired to do are you being inspired to continue in sin and to continue uh, living after you, the lust of your flesh or are you being inspired to draw closer to God in righteousness and truth you see that that's the difference God preaches always point you back to him and his holiness and his righteousness uh the world preachers, they're more concerned with inspiring you with the things of this world. 
In other words, God wants you to have a better life on this side. And God wants you to be the best that you can be on this side. Never talk about heaven. No, because we're trying to push that off. Let's get everything that we can get on this side. Let's enjoy it all on this side and hate death. But believers don't hate death. B believers accept it. Why? Because you know that for you to, to be in the presence of God, physically so, you're going to have to cross that line. Worldly preachers preach about the world and loving the world. God wants you to be blessed. He wants you to have cars. He wants you to have houses. Let's have heaven on this side. That's, what the, that's the devil's doctrine. The Bible says that there's a such thing as do, doctrines of demons. Mm -hmm. You see, the devil has a Bible too. The devil has preachers too. He transforms himself into an angel of light. Why? To deceive people. And it's so what does that tell us? It's not going to be obvious. And so I encourage anybody that's sitting in a church uh, where the preacher is preaching questionable doctrine. And what I mean is uh, that goes against God's word, where there's not holiness being preached, where there's not God's word being treat, preached with truth and purity. God didn't send that preacher. And if God didn't send that preacher, then what are you following? You cannot follow a preacher and not go where he go. He's going to lead you somewhere. Everybody understand? That false prophet is going to lead you somewhere. If God have sent a preacher, and no matter if God sent them or whoever, whoever they're sent by, you'll, you'll adapt to whatever is on the inside of you. So if you're somebody that's covetous, you'll follow a preacher that's covetous because that's what flesh want to hear. A flesh want to hear all of the candy that God has for you on this side. Flesh don't want to hear about change. Flesh don't want to be challenged to grow in the Lord, you see. And so if you're following a preacher that's hell bound, in other words, a preacher that God didn't send, then you're going where he's going. Jesus said the blind lead the blind. And if, and if the blind is leading the blind, then who? One of them is going to fall into the ditch. Only the leader is going to know. He said they both fall into the ditch. So if you're following a false prophet and, and excusing it, because, well, you know, he's inspirational. The false prophets hell bound and so are you for following them. You see, Jesus Christ said, my sheep hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. That means if you're sitting in a false church, you better check yourself and see where you standing with the Lord. You see, and so we're not going to uh, sugarcoat this. We're just going to tell the truth. If you're following a, following a false prophet, maybe it's because you're a false Christian. Maybe you're, in a, you're not in the place where you think you are, you see. And so we just have to tell it like that. Uh, God's people hear his truth. They hear his voice. And a stranger they will not follow. It's not going to take you long to figure out who the false prophets are if you have the spirit of truth living on the inside of you, you see. And so God don't want us to be deceived. He do not want us to be deceived, you see. E evil communication, corrupt good manners. If you got a corrupt preacher up preaching... And you sit there long enough, guess what's going to happen? Even if, you, even if you go there in innocency. In other words, you don't know everything that's going on in that church right off the hand. And so you go there and, and you begin to see things that's not sitting right. Evil communication corrupt good manners. If the preacher, whatever spirit the preacher has, that's the spirit that you're going to take on, you see. If you haven't taken on that spirit. And so God don't want you sitting under false teaching. You know, and I'm not one of those preachers that's going to think that's going to tell you, well, you know, we're just all serving the same God. So let's just all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. That's not how it is. You see, I take it serious because people are dying and going to hell every day behind following some false preacher who had them living by a false standard. You see. And so that's not God's will. All right. Let's go of Matthew, the 10th chapter of Matthew. Uh, uh, verse, we'll start reading at verse 5. <clears throat> and he reads, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. All right? But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead, cast out devils, 
Freely you have received, freely give. Now, uh, we're going to have to say this. Uh, preachers today aren't living by this. They aren't giving freely, even though they claim to have received freely. Everybody understand? Mm -hmm. There's a charge for hearing preachers today. You can't, all of these churches, a lot of these churches, they have what they call conferences. And <laughs> beneath all of the big names that you'll see who will be preaching at this conference, you'll see a registration fee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me make this clear. That's of the devil. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ nowhere in this Bible told us to charge to preach the gospel. He said if whatever, basically what he says is if someone gives you something, you receive that, but he doesn't charge. There's, there was no registration fee. Jesus Christ weren't, wasn't worried about renting some big building or synagogue somewhere to house the people. When the crowd got too large, he took them way out in the country somewhere and just preached to them in the field. Why? Because I don't want to charge the people. They already don't have enough to eat. That's why he had to feed them. So we're not going to charge to preach the gospel. That's Jesus saying that. But today, preachers, they get a little name to themselves, get linked up with other preachers, not for the purpose of fellowship, but for the purpose of just being recognized and for the purpose of if I line myself up with this preacher, you know, then I'll be somebody. And so when my name get big enough and I draw a big crowd, I'll charge a registration fee. And I'll charge that fee saying, well, you know, uh, this is to hold your seat or this is to pay for the venue that we're renting. That's all lies. That's all from the devil. And that's what turns people off away, away from God. That's what people turn, that's what turn people away from God is when they see that we're not lining up with God's word. Any preacher that charges for you to come and sit down to hear, quote unquote, the word of God is not sent by God. God did not charge He's, what, what do we see here? It says, freely you have received, freely give. That, that includes the gifts that we have. You, you know, preaching is a gift from God. It's something that is given to us. Now, what do I look like? You know, when God gives me things to say uh, from this pulpit, I don't have to go and, and pay some money and put it into and deposit it into his checking account somewhere to receive from him. All I have to do is just get on my face before him and just be ready and, and listen all throughout the day to what he has to say. That's it. There, uh, there's no charge on my part. And so what do I look like receiving freely from God the things that he want me to say and then charging you to receive those things? Amen. You see? Amen. That's, but that's what's going on. That is what's going on in church. You just, you know, uh, you got to pay to come to church. You got to pay your membership dues and, and all of these things. And I, I was sitting in a church, in an apostolic church, uh, so-called, here in Nashville a few years ago. And it just so happened the morning that I was sitting there, they were paying their membership dues to be a part of the apostolic association. Baptist churches do the same thing. Pentecostal churches, the same thing. If you wear that name, if you, then, if you wear any denominational name, you have to pay a fee. To the, to the head organization to even wear the name. There was a church up in Maryland. Uh, in fact, it was an a AME church whose organization had came and put a padlock on their church door because they were behind in paying fees. And that's common, you see. Now, you won't hear about it because preachers who are a part of this mess they won't tell the congregation about what's all of the dirt that goes on behind the scene. But I'm going to tell you, it's all a pyramid scheme from hell. You see, that is that is what's wrong with the organizational churches today, with the Baptist church, the Pentecostal, the Methodist, all of these churches. They pay fees. Why do I have to pay you a fee to preach the gospel? If I call myself believing the same thing that Baptist people believe, why do I need to pay a fee to preach it? You see? It's all of the devil. 
It, and, and as I stated before, they're only going to do what their mama did, the Roman Catholic Church. Because what did their mama do? Many of you, if you remember in your history books, they had a thing what they call penance. In other words, when you sin, you paid the Catholic priest for your sin. Now, what does that come from? The old covenant. You see, th these churches, they'll never, ever uh, come out of the old covenant because for them to wear names, it, it goes back to there in the first place. What, what does that come from? Well, for you to have a relationship with God, you have to first go through the, the Catholic priest, you see, and you confess your sins to the priest. The Bible don't say that. You know, think about it. Who, who is it? That's, that's stuck behind the, the, the title of father. What do they call their priest? They call him father. And what did Jesus say? Call no man father. He said, but you are all brothers. You see? But he said, and he said, don't be like the Pharisees who love to be called rabbi. They love titles. And in these churches today, you have, they, they, again, I say that they did exactly what their mama did if you pay attention to it. Even Baptist churches, so-called full gospel, they got bishops now and archbishops. And, and you know, now the, the churches on the outside of that, they have a, uh, what they call chief apostles and chief prophets when there's no such thing in the Bible. If you're a prophet, that's what you are, a prophet. You're not a chief prophet. <laughs> you're not a chief apostle. If you're an apostle, that's what you are. And, and then you notice here in the Bible, nobody called each other by titles. Peter called Paul, Paul, our brother. It, it wasn't, you know, they knew that they were apostles. They didn't have to put those titles in front of their names. Mm -hmm. But what is it? Is it? These are things that appeal to the flesh, you see. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we have to be careful about. And so Jesus says, freely you have received, freely give. Now, what does this take us back to? When you get to charging for something that God have given you or something that you say that God have given you, You'll get yourself in trouble. And, and we see that in the book of 2 Kings when the prophet Elisha had healed the Syrian uh, Naaman. And Naaman was pleased with that. And so Naaman offered Elisha gifts. Here, take this. You're a man of God. I appreciate you healing me of this leprosy. Here, take these gifts. And Elisha said, no, it's not time to receive gifts. God gave me the, the, the spirit to be able to heal people. And this is free. And so he went on about his business. And so what did Gehazi do? The servant of Elisha? He got greedy. And he went after Naaman and said, look, my Lord Elisha have changed his mind. We have some, some, some prophets that have come into the school uh, that we need some garments for and some food and, and things like that. So we'll take those gifts now. And so when he went back to the tent and he, and he hid that stuff, he went to, in to Elisha, and Elisha said, where, did you, where have you been? And he said, oh, just, you know, just hanging out, basically. And Elisha said, did not my spirit go with you when you went after those gifts that I had turned down? Now, think about it. He wasn't even the one who did the healing. He had nothing to do with the healing, but he wanted, he wanted the gifts for it. He wanted to be paid for it, and that's how preachers are. We don't heal people. God does. Oh, we may pray for them, but God is the one that does the healing. So who are we to, who are we to charge people for it? Any preacher that charged somebody for preaching don't realize that God is the one that's preaching in the first place. You see? And so what happens if we'll be, watch this, this, this story carefully, we'll see what God think about it. What happened? Elisha said, the same leprosy that was on Naaman will now cleave to you for the rest of your days. And not only you, but your sons and your children from here on out. Your offspring is going to have leprosy. Everybody that's born to you and your family, they're going to have leprosy. And no wonder preachers are leaving here today sick and, and got things wrong in their bodies. You see, God's word doesn't change. And, and what, when you say you represent God, you better represent him correctly. You see, God is not pleased when you misrepresent him. You see, he's not pleased with that. God does not charge people to preach to them. If he was going to be that type of God, he never would have laid the sins of the world on his son's back. He would, we would have just been paying for our own sins if he was going to be that type of God. And so if he loved us enough to send his son to die for us so that we can be saved, why would he turn around and charge us 
to hear the message that it takes to be saved. God doesn't change. You see, God doesn't change. All right. And so God, that, that, you know, it, it's a shame what's happening. And we have preachers today who, who preach messages and put them on DVDs and CDs and then want to charge the people for it. You know, that is not of God. That is not of God. And so we just have to make it clear. We have to make it plain. God is not in that business of, of charging people. You see, he says, freely you have received, freely give. Um, God is not into people selling out of his church either. Now, he hasn't changed that either. You see, and we just have to tell that like it is. We have preachers who travel around who have wrote a couple of books, you know, and they spend most of their time trying to sell you what they got to sell. You see, when 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 Jesus Christ in his day, he whooped people out of his church for selling, buying and selling. And he says, is it not written that my my house should be called a house of prayer, but yet you've turned it into a den of thieves. You see why? What what makes a thief? What makes a thief? Somebody is taking what what don't belong to them. You see, and so what? How does that translate today? When I sell you something that don't belong to me, in other words, the message of God, that makes me a thief. You see, and and when you buy it, <laughs> you're guilty of the crime too. You see, Amen. you and God doesn't charge for His wisdom. What does the word say in the book of James? If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who give freely and upbraideth not. You don't have to pay for God's wisdom. What would God look like charging you for his wisdom and then sending you to hell because you can't afford it? You see? So we better get back to God's word. We better get back there. All right, let's go ahead and keep reading here. <clears throat> Verse 9. It says, provide neither gold nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves. For the workman is worthy of his hire. That means that when God sends you somewhere, you don't have to pack a big old suitcase to get there and, and be worried about what you're going to eat and all this other stuff or how, what's going to be provided. He's saying that if I send you, I'm going to make sure that you are taken care of. You see, for a work, workman is worthy of his hire. And so back in these days, when preachers went to different cities to preach, uh, they stayed with the saints in the homes of the saints. All right? Let's keep reading here. We'll understand that. Uh, says, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Verse 11, and, what, and into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go thence. In other words, when, when preachers go into a city, they ought to stay with the saints of, people, of God, you see. Inquire in it of who's worthy. In other words, you don't want to stay with people who are full of the devil, who's got devil worshiping going on and things like that. You inquire who's, who's worthy, you see. Verse 12 says, and when you come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And, wo and whosoever shall receive you shall not receive you, nor hear your words. When ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now I want you to notice the authority that he's given his preachers. That when folks don't receive them, what are they to do? They're to shake off the dust of their feet. It's a testimony against that city and against people. Now, this lets us know that God sends preachers. And when people don't receive those preachers, you automatically reject God. God operates through his preachers, his preachers, you see. And so if you're going to receive God, you have to receive God's preacher. There's no way around that. The day we live in a day and we live in a day and age full of arrogancy and pride. Everybody think I can hear from God just like anybody. That the Bible don't teach that. And, and we're going to go over that in a little bit. It don't mean that God won't deal with you personally. He's a person of God, which is why uh, Jesus Christ came, because he wanted the, the middle wall of petition to be broken down. So he does deal with us individually. You see. But let me make this clear. The mysteries, according to the book of Ephesians, of God are only revealed to those two offices, the apostles and prophets. 
Now, so if you want a deep relationship with God and you want to know who truly God is, you better be attached to one of these two, either an apostle or a prophet. It's not given to pastors. Now, let me make this clear as well. Uh, when, since we're talking about offices, one person can hold all five offices or, or maybe two offices or three offices or, or whatever the case is, you see. And so your pastor might be an apostle. Your pastor might be a prophet. Jeremiah, uh, he was a, a pastor as well, you know. I think it's in the 16th chapter of the book of Jeremiah, the 17th verse. He says, as for me, I have not... Uh, uh, ceased from being a pastor. We know he was a prophet because in the first chapter of Jeremiah, God said, I've ordained you a prophet, you see. And But if you're going to understand the mysteries of God, it comes to these two offices. Not, you know, not to you, you know, going off in a hilltop somewhere, uh, in a mountain somewhere, and, and, and trying to hear from God. These things are revealed through these two offices, the apostles and prophets. You might understand some basic things with Jesus Christ. He died for my sins, and I believe that, and so I accept that, you see. But if you're going to understand the mysteries of God, apostles and prophets, those are the two offices that hold those mysteries, who God revealed those mysteries to, you see. And so that's one, that's one of the things, and, and we'll go over that here. So you see in the 14th and the 15th verse, what Jesus says, that if they don't receive you nor hear your words, you depart out of that house. And what does he say? It's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than it will for those people. Why? Because God takes it serious when he sends preachers and, and people don't listen. Just like he, he takes it serious when the devil sends preachers and everybody flock to him. You see? Flesh want to hear what flesh want to hear. And so uh, God want us to to uh to to know that that he has sent preachers let, let me just put this rhetorical question out there and this is something that you can ponder okay if everybody could hear from god in the exact same way in other words if everybody just had god would just reveal himself the exact same way to everybody all of the mysteries you want to know Everything that you there is to know about him. If God did that to everybody, what is the purpose of preachers? Why would there be a difference? We would all just be preachers then. We would all there would be no need for a preacher if everybody could hear from God those mysteries that are entangled in his word here. There would be no need for a preacher. We just there would be no need to come to church. We don't need to hear. We can just all hear from God ourselves. Let's just stay all stay home. You see? No, God has preachers. Now, here's the thing that we better know and that we better recognize. When we get off in our corner and God ain't, ain't, didn't put us there, didn't lead us there, in other words, to hear from him, or if we're not walking in the offices that were mentioned before and we think we're going to get some mystery, oh, yeah, you'll get a mystery. And you might have all kind of angels appearing to you, but it's not going to be of God. That's part of the reason why we got so much false doctrine out there. Because people aren't sticking with God's word, you see. Well, God revealed this mystery to me. Uh, God revealed this to me. Uh, but you're not a preacher. And so how God couldn't have revealed it to you. What, everybody understand? We're talking about to share with other people. Mm -hmm. You see? The devil is very cunning and very deceptive. Uh uh, there was an old man who I, who some of you heard my mother mention uh, <clears throat> a few days ago. Uh, he, he revealed a story to me, you know, and he was a man, you know, if you ever sit around him, he brings this Bible alive to you because of how he walked with the Lord. You see, he was he just brought this Bible alive. You see, it's just it's just his lifestyle. And then if you are if you're around him uh, uh, quite often. You'll be thinking that you're really spiritual and really in a place. But, he, you know, he's he's the type of person that he brings you up in the Lord is, is what I mean. You know, he, he when you're around him, you see that you have room to grow. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that we should be around. Folks that that help us to know I still got room to grow. Mm -hmm. And he told me a story one time where uh, this bird flew into the house. Now, he was the type. He was always hearing from God. And he would go prophesy different things, you know, 
and, and things like that. And so this bird, this little dove, flew into his house and sat behind him on the chair that he was sitting in. And this bird began to talk to him. Now, of course, a dove, what does it represent? The Holy Spirit. You see, wasn't, that wasn't something that was uncommon to him. He didn't take off running or think it was strange. The Lord dealt with him in a lot of ways that, you know, different ways. And so the bird told him that something was going to happen in another country. And uh, he, he at first thought it was the Lord speaking, you know. And so he, when he went to work the next day, uh, he told a group of the men that were out there what, what this bird told him, whom he assumed to be the Holy Spirit. He said, but something strange happened that when he, uh, after he told it, he felt like he had done something very, very wrong, which is something that he had never felt before. And he said he literally put his hand over his mouth. And he could hear the Lord say, don't say that again. Don't you tell that again. And so about a week later, in comes this bird again. He, he, he sits on the back of the chair. And the bird began to talk again. Now, again, you know, you see the, the, the Holy Spirit we're talking now, you see. And it, all of a sudden, it just registered, registered in him. This is not the Lord. This is the devil that have transformed himself into an angel of light. And he, and he called that, and he said that as the bird was talking, the bird did something strange. It's turned around. And he looked at it, and, and he saw a little bitty black dot. On the tail of that bird. And he's called that bird out. He said you deceiving spirit. You the one that came in here and told that lie. The first time. And he said after he said that. That bird flew into the middle of his living room. And it began to spin around. And it turned into all kind of demonic beasts. And filled the room up with smoke. Why? Because the devil had been exposed. This is what I'm saying. You have folks in church who are so glad about hearing a word. That they don't check it by God's word. Amen. The devil transformed himself into an angel of light. So it's no wonder that his ministers transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. They transform themselves. God don't transform them. God don't make them apostles. They make themselves apostles. And how do you check it? By the word here. You see, by the word. And so when that devil was exposed, he showed who he really was. Oh, I'm not just this little humble dove. I'm really the devil, you see, and that's what we better know. The dove, the, the devil comes portraying himself to be Jesus Christ, portraying himself to be holy. But we'll know, you know, we'll, we'll know who he is by the doctrine that he preached. He will not preach God's word plainly. He will always twist up scriptures and, and misuse them and, and, and twist them up and, and everything else. So if you have your Bibles, let's go now to the 10th chapter of the book of Romans. All right, 10th chapter of the book of Romans, we'll start reading the verse uh, <clears throat> 10. It says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, this is talking about what, what, what takes place when people get saved. Verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Mm -hmm. And how shall they believe in, in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You see that? Now, let's, it, it's three things here. The first thing, now we're going to go backwards in verse 14. The preacher has to be sent to preach so that you can hear the truth. OK, the second thing is you have to believe that truth. And then after you believe that truth, then you call on the name of the Lord. 
but it has to be a God sent preacher. You see now. So what happens uh, uh, in this process when it's not a God sent preacher, it's some preacher that have sent themselves. You will hear what that preacher say, but it'll be lies. You will believe those lies if you sit there long enough and entertain those lies. And then you will call upon the name of a God, but it will be the father of lies. And that father of lies will make you think that you're saved. Everybody understand? It has to be a God sent preacher. The Bible says right here that you cannot hear without a preacher. How can they hear? Without a preacher. Verse 15. It says. And how, they, how, and how shall they preach. Except they be sent. Mm -hmm. and, now that's. Who, sent by who? Mm -hmm. By God. Mm -hmm. Not by some seminary school. Not by your pastor. Who thought it was a good idea. Because the anointing is all over this person. Or whatever they may think. You see. They have to be sent by God. To preach. You see. And then after they've been sent by God. And they preach. That's when you hear. But listen, you don't hear without the preacher. A God sent preacher. You see, you, you have to hear a God sent preacher to hear God's word clearly. That his word is opened up where we understand it better when we're dealing with a God sent preacher. It, it's not just the surface stuff of God wants you to have a better life. That's psychology. And unfortunately, psychology have replaced the gospel in the church. People go to church to get therapy now. And instead of learning the ways of God, you see, instead of learning the ways of God. Verse 15, again, and how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. You see, that's God's word. Now, so you may say, well, Brother Bolin, we want to see that in the Bible. Uh, 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 that, that it takes one, a, a preacher to be sent. Well, let's, let's go real quick to the eighth chapter of the book of Acts. The eighth chapter of the book of Acts. Now, let's. Keep in mind here, okay, that uh, that uh, the church has been persecuted uh, by Saul, especially. And, and during this persecution, uh, we see that one of the deacons, a man that started off as a deacon named Philip, God is using him mightily, do mighty miracles. And uh, folks are being saved by droves under the ministry of Philip. It was this same Philip who had four virgin daughters who prophesied, you see. And so we see. That is a big revival going on, basically, in the place where, where Philip is. A big revival. All right, so let's start reading. We're going to start reading verse 26 in the 8th chapter of, uh, of, the, of the book of Acts. It says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority, Anna Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all of her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. He read Isaiah the prophet. Everybody see that? So here's a man who's, who's reading the Bible. He's reading the Bible, you see. Now, the angel of the Lord appeared to Philip and told him to go down there. That's all the angel said. Go down there. Didn't tell him what to do. Just And now here's, here's a, a, a clue for us. We're not going to always get the whole story right up front. Amen. We just have to do what God is telling us to do then. And, and then as we o obey him and what he's in the instructions that he's already given, then we'll find out more about what we're supposed to do. You see, verse 29 says, then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. You see that? So the angel, when the angel uh, first appeared to him, he just said, go on down, uh, arise and go down south, uh, you know, from Jerusalem unto Gaza. That's it. And then when he gets down there, then the angel says, okay, you see that chariot there? Go join yourself to that. Now you keep in mind, these are two different nations we're talking about. You see? 
Two different nations. <laughs> what does he say about going to join himself? Go, go get close to it and, and, you know, you'll be invited in there, you see. Now, that's like somebody, you're seeing somebody sitting in a car reading the Bible and the Lord tell you, go, go just get in the car there. You better know the Lord's with you, you see. <laughs> All right. Verse 30. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, What? How can I? Except some man should guide me. You better know it. He didn't say, I don't need you, preacher. God speak to me just like he speak to you. I've been reading this Bible for years now. I got it. No, he said, how can I except some man guide me? You see, that, that's the purpose of the preacher is to guide us in God's word. Preachers tie God's word together and make it all one. You see, instead of reading this scripture, okay, I understand for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see, we're not talking about taking individual scriptures. We're talking about being guided through God's word. Getting an, an understanding. You think you have an understanding until some preachers stand up and, and give you that understanding from the God himself, you see. Those mysteries are revealed to apostles and prophets. They're the ones that bring depth, in-depth understanding of God's word. Oh, yeah, there's some things you'll understand on the surface, you see. But we're talking about the mysteries of God being revealed by God himself. And so here... Philip here, this Ethiopian reading the book of Isaiah, and he asked him, do you understand what you're reading? Now, humility said, how can I understand it? Mm -hmm. Now, what does that let us know? That there are plenty of people in the body of Christ who are reading their Bible who may not be getting an understanding of these deep things of God. It's because God didn't give it to them to understand. God sends preachers to open your understanding concerning God's word. You see? You, you won't be able to connect it together. That's eternal. You might be able to read a book in here, you know, and say, okay, yeah, I see why he wrote this letter and, 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 and things like that. I understand where he's going with it. But tying it all together, only God himself can do that. Why? Because it's really all one book in the first place. You see? It's really all one book in the first place. And so here he says, how can I except some man guide me? That showed his humility. He understood. I can't understand this mystery here that I'm reading. So how can I understand it unless some man guide me? What man was he talking about? A man of God. A, a, a man that God have sent. And the last part of the verse says, And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer. So opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at that same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Amen. You see, you don't get the full picture of Jesus without the Lord's artist painting that canvas for you. To get that, to see the full picture of it, you see. You, it, it takes God's person to do that. Verse 36, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, here, see here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Mm -hmm. Now, what, is, uh, what does that let us know? There was a revival going on before this took place, and while this was taking place, and God separated Philip for the purpose, sending him to another country, to preach to one man. Amen. God didn't say, you know, I'm not going to waste this preacher's time. I'm just going to reveal myself to, to, to this Ethiopian treasurer. I'm just going to reveal myself to him. And, uh, you know, that way I, I can just keep all the preachers where they are and just let them continue on in what they got going. If God saw the necessity of sending one man 
you know, to a whole different city and country to preach to one man. It shows us that he will not move without his preacher. Everybody understand? God will not move without his preacher. If God was going to do that, he would have did it in this story. He would have just talked to the Ethiopian himself, except he didn't do it. It takes a preacher for you to receive salvation. You don't get saved just off to your corner, you know, off in the corner by yourself. You have to hear something first to be saved. If, if God was going to, God's not going to bypass his word. He's not going to bypass his preacher. But again, we're living in a day and age where people are full of pride. You know, just I, I'm hearing from God just like you. And really what you're doing is you're blocking God out. You'll hear from somebody, uh, but it won't be God. It'll be some other spirit and making himself, you know, changing himself into an angel of light, you see. And so God is not going to change. We even see, and we won't turn that now, but we even see the great apostle Paul. When God got his attention on the road to Damascus. In fact, let's go look at that. Let's go look at that. Let me see here. All right, the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. And we'll start reading at verse 9. <clears throat> I mean, I'm sorry, ninth chapter, we'll start reading at verse 1. It says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way. Now, this is what the children of God were called at this time, people of the way. Where did they get that from? Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, you see. And so they were called, all throughout this book here, you see, they were called people of the way. It was the church at Antioch that first became called Christians. But at first, they were called people of the way, which is what they were, you see. All right, verse 2. And desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round, round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So let's, let's explain what's going on here. Saul was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader of his day. And he thought, that he was on a mission from God. He really thought that God was leading him. Until God got his attention and said, why are you persecuting me? You see, what does that mean? That there are preachers standing in the pulpit today, still pre persecuting the church. Why? Because they've gone their own way and they think that they've heard from God and they really uh, got on a, a banner for war, but except it's on the devil's side, you see. Saul was working for the devil, but he was a religious leader. He was a minister and he thought he was on God's side. You see, but he was. And so that lets us know how people can be deceived. All right. Verse six. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do. You see, look at what he says there. You see, he said, it's going to be told you what you're going to do. Let's keep reading. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. You see, he was blind. What did God have to do for him? He had to put him in a natural condition where he was spiritually. In other words, you're spiritually blind, Saul, except you don't know it. And so I'm going to make you naturally blind. Notice what he says there. Verse 8, and Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. In other words, when he naturally opened his eyes, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand. If you don't first realize that you're blind, you won't be led by anybody. Amen. You see, Saul had to be led by men who could see. Now, that's, that's the spiritual picture that God wants us to see here. Uh, several years ago, God had me to preach a message uh, uh, about, about that that only those who are born blind will see Jesus Christ. In other words, if you don't realize you're blind, you're in trouble. You are in trouble. So it's going to take you being led by the hand. You see, verse 9, 
says, And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And he to, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And had seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, and that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered unto the house, and putting his hand on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received his sight and forthwith arose and was baptized. Now, I want you to see what's going on here. God... Now, Apostle Paul was one of the greatest men in the Bible. He wrote, uh, uh, you know, somewhere between a half and, and two-thirds of the New Testament by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And God, when God got his attention on that road, God didn't say, well, Saul, I'm just going to deal with you. You don't have to go through anybody. I'm just going to deal with you. He said, no, you go to get up and go in the city. And, I, and it'll be told to you what you shall do. He didn't say, I was going to tell you. Why? Because if I was going to tell you, I would have told you right then. He said, go into the city and it shall be told. And so uh, Saul was praying, the Bible says. And as he was praying, he saw a vision of a man named Ananias coming in. What, what, was that? what did that mean? There was a preacher, Saul, that you're going to have to listen to. You're going to have to come the same way everybody else come. Everybody understand? And, and Saul couldn't have the attitude, well, Lord, I, you know, if, if you've chosen me this, in this manner, you've dealt with me, you know, uh, you, you spoke to me already, just keep on speaking. No, Saul, you're going to have to go the way everybody else came, you see. Nobody gets saved without hearing a preacher. Now, if you, say, if you think you're saved without hearing a preacher, you're not saved. Let me just put it that way, you see. And so Saul is, the Bible is letting us know that Saul had to hear from Ananias. And you know what the strange thing, strange thing is? This is the last time we hear anything about Ananias. We don't see him mentioned anymore in the word of God. But we see Paul all through the rest of the New Testament doing these great mighty works for the Lord. But he, even all the great and mighty works that he did, it had to come through another man. In the, in the beginning of this, this chapter in chapter 9, Jesus said, uh, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. What was he saying to Saul? Saul had just got finished uh, watching Stephen get stoned and consenting unto his death. And he heard the gospel. And he was doing what so many other people do. When they hear the gospel, they resist it. Why? Because I already know what God's will is. I already, God is already dealing with me. Or so I think. But what was Saul doing? He was going against his conscience. You heard the word. Now what are you going to do with it? Saul already thought he was in a place. You see, he already thought that he was mature in the Lord. I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisee. Except God didn't ordain Pharisees. You see. And so he heard that gospel preached from some little old deacon named Stephen. How dare this little old fella here call me out. You see. And, and so and that's what the word of the God, word of God lets us know. Is that we have to hear from a preacher if, the, if we're going to understand God's word. He understood, <clears throat> he understood the law. And so Stephen, as he was preaching, if you go back and read that, you'll see that Stephen was using the law lawfully to show them where they were and, and why they were blind. You see? And so Saul heard that and, and, and it stuck with him. And even though he was being hateful and wanted to go persecute more Christians, he had heard something that he knew wrong true. And that's what happens today uh, in, in the church. Folks will hear the word of the Lord and, and they'll know that it's true, but pride to keep them from receiving it because after all, I can hear from God myself. When God says you cannot hear without a preacher, you see, it don't mean that the preacher has to take you and hold your hand, 
uh, and through every step of your life. It just means if you want to hear from God, it's going to be through that preacher. It don't mean that God don't deal with you, that God won't speak to you about yourself and things like that. But we're talking about the mysteries of God. To get an understanding of God in his mysteries that he has in his Bible, you're going to have to hear from a preacher to do that. Amen.